think after hearing that. <laughs> we had the youth group in here Sunday. I asked them to leave the dials exactly as they found them, but there you go. <laughs> so it was a little loud. So uh, can you hear me now in the back? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for coming. Wow. There's a person in this room that's celebrating a birthday today, and she's here in class. Can you imagine that? Phoebe. Phoebe, back there. It's a big birthday. What's the number? 20. 20. Oh, what a big round. Yay! Wow. 20 years old and you're here in class. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And I understand that Seth is going to take her for another milkshake after this or when they had dinner here and they said, this is a birthday dinner. So thank you. Yeah, glad you're here. Thanks to all of you for being here. It's just really great on this night. And we're going to continue the journey, the journey together. And just in case you uh, need to have a little list of the classes, you know, pocket size, we have them too, you know. So here's the 25 classes we're showing them here. And so we have these little guys to either hand out, maybe share, or carry with you to kind of remember the different topics. So they're here and available. And here we are already in the class schedule. And uh, class number six, is that what this is? Yeah, class number six. And uh, we're moving right along. We're going to have the next four classes are on the Mass. And so that's the highest form of celebration. So it, because it's so important, we want to break it down. We're going to have two on the liturgy, the liturgy of the Word and the Eucharist. And then where is that in the Bible? Many people non-Catholic, they say, where is that in the Bible? So we're going to show part one and part two. And then by that time, we take a break. That's time for Thanksgiving. And then we come back and continue the second, third of the uh, classes that we'd like to cover. So... Big, big, big time ahead of us. Uh, I want to welcome you. And let's see, we want to thank those uh, ladies back there, uh, Julia and Callie. Come on out for a second. And what was the name of the creation? I don't eat till after this, so they give me a care box. Hey, Julia and, and Callie, come on out here. There they are. Okay. What was the name of the creation tonight? I was on sort of a Philly cheesesteak. A Philly cheesesteak. Okay. Did you enjoy it? If those that had it, okay. Thanks, you ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Beautiful. That is so good. Some were very uh, satisfied. And I think they're all going to get into the mode of learning to come hungry. <laughs> Some people come and they've already eaten. So just in case um, you want to count on us, we're going to have a little meal every time. So very good. also want to thank uh, uh, Lori and Carol and Carol on the back table. Thank you so much for being here, ladies. They have it so organized, books and attendance and badges and everything. So thank you so much for your care. And uh, Ryan and Joshua over here, to make it possible for us to uh, do all this. They wire this up and all. And so we even have virtual so that there are people that can see it now live stream or they can see it at their leisure or you can see it again. So it's very, very good. I want to welcome all of you that might be watching at any time that you choose to view this. It's very good. This has really taken um, um, charge with regard to what we've experienced with COVID-19. We're filming weddings. We film funerals. We just had a big wedding where uh, some, not everybody could come. And so, wow. Um, then we just had a Sunday Mass uh, this past Sunday at 11 o'clock where uh, two people from the University of Alabama came into the Catholic Church at 11 o'clock. One young lady, uh, she came in by baptism and the other by profession of faith. And relatives were in different parts of the country, P Pennsylvania, I think, and Georgia. And so we chose the 11 o'clock Mass because that experience, that great new beginning for them could be viewed even from a different state. And so it was very, very good. I think we might have a snippet of that at some point here. Is that right? Uh, so this would be a point er in the liturgy. This is the young lady. That's Natalie. And Nick is the man in the white shirt. And that's next to them is their sponsor. And it's so wonderful. These young people are in the uh, university level and they get that hunger for God. What am I going to do? They went and sat where you're sitting all year last year. They were in the class last year. And then uh, with COVID-19, you know, we didn't even have the liturgy for Easter, you know, because they kind of told us the churches we couldn't gather and all that. And so they went home to their state. And then uh, when they came back to school here, Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we just lost power there. And um, so they've been back, and they've been very excited, so excited to see if they could uh, come into the Catholic Church. If you're not baptized and you're here in the class, then that's essential. What we are going to talk, we're going to have a whole class just on baptism. That according to our Lord, 
you must be born again in John 3. He says you must be born of water and the Holy Spirit in order to enter the family of God. And so the young lady, she underwent the waters of baptism over here. And then Nick, he had already been baptized in another faith tradition. And so he wanted to come into the Catholic faith tradition. And so they're going to read, I don't know, is there motion here? Do you know? Okay, there is a little slip of paper there that kind of summarizes, you know, the class and the instruction. And they'll, uh, they'll read, it says, I believe and profess all that the Holy Catholic Holy, all the Holy Catholic Church believes, preaches, and teaches as true. And so that's their statement. And the candle would be for her baptism and all. And like I say, then uh, they were able to receive our Lord. We talk about Holy Communion. So at the time for Holy Communion, they received their first Holy Communion. She was so excited that she came back for Mass uh, Monday morning. So at 6.45, we have Mass every day. And she came back and, and glowingly received our Lord. And she came on. I said, that's your second Holy Communion, you know. And not like we're counting, but, you know, through the years, if you do come every Sunday, that's 52 a year. And then if you start coming daily, that's a lot of unions with our Lord. So I just wanted to show you that. That's on the altar there. And that may be before you, if you choose. There is no pressure. I mean, this is something they did freely. They came and sat here and attended the classes. And, you know, they said it lived for them to do what they wanted to do. And so they came into church. So... Thank you for putting that in there, a little grab from, uh, this was the recorded mass, and uh, Ryan took a, a, a little grab from that and put it here. Good. Okay, yeah, please, go ahead. Well, I mean, we say, I believe and profess uh, all the... Oh, John 3, yes, indeed. John 3, you bet. That's where Nicodemus asked Jesus... What do I need to do to get to heaven? He says, you must be born again. And so, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't hear that. Okay. All right. So, we're ready to go and as far as our instruction tonight. Any questions so far? And any questions at any time? I think we have a few more things here. Probably, Ryan. Uh, here's our, our sister church, St. Francis, next door. They're about three miles away. We're sim similar on Mass times for Sunday. We both have 845 and 11. We have a one. It's for the Hispanic community, but still a valid Mass. If you want to attend, beautiful. Weekdays every morning, 645. And then they have evening masses at the university for the university students, uh, 7 p.m. on Sunday and then uh, noon and then uh, later in the day on Monday through Wednesday. So, And then a couple more just to review. There's the question box if you want to write something down. There was nothing in it last week. And you can ask the question if it was just it or you can put it in the box. And then the next one would be, um, we are going to record this, again, audio. And if you would like a copy, just the next week, just come and get a copy. And you can listen to it again, not the video, but the audio, like in your car. And then we have, um, this is beautiful. Thanks, Ryan, for putting this up here. So if you folks can see this, you know, if you're attending us virtually, we'd like to know you. So if you would call the office and speak to Lori, uh, our uh, office manager, and then you can let us know, and then we can keep you posted. We can uh, give you a call if the class ever changes. We can send you updates and things like that. Oh, it's just like, I think last week we had eight watching online, and we had like eight new people here in the room. So I mean, we know that people are, t are taking advantage of the virtual. And then uh, you can send in questions on YouTube, like Ryan asked a couple in one class, and we can try to answer them live. Okay, beautiful. And then what's next here? Our Bible. I mean, the, the Bible that we offer here, the New American Bible, NAB, it's here if you don't have one and would like one. And then we also have the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, the compilation of what we're teaching. And that's a good resource book, and we're going to use it tonight. So uh, beautiful. So you'll use them through. So I'll turn on the CD, and we'll go ahead and we'll have our opening prayer, and then our beginning of our session on the saints. Very good. We're going to begin our prayer by tracing out the sign of the cross, the sign of our salvation, if you choose. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Jesus, as we journey on in this last quarter of 2020, our desire is to more fully appropriate your great love for us here, so as to merit to live with you in heaven for all eternity. We realize that we do this. to do this, we must become holy, as you are holy. While this is challenging indeed, it is very possible. Throughout the ages, many men and women have done this, and your church holds them up in high esteem as saints. They are our models. They are our inspiration. They are our guides. Enable us to see 
how they can intercede for us to receive your divine help. Please bless all the catechumens, that's the unbaptized, the candidates, those already baptized, and the Catholics that are with us here. Uh, and plus, bless them with the gifts of courage and perseverance as they seek to unite themselves ever more intimately with you. Jesus, we ask all of this of the Father in your holy name. For you are the Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Very good. I'm going to welcome you once again with the very welcome I give at every student mass. We have the student mass get over here on Thursdays. And um, I love it when they're all there. We have three classes now because of COVID-19 and we live stream it to the classrooms to the rest. But I say, good morning, saints. <laughs> and they all come back and say, good morning, Father. And I try to explain to them each and every time so that they get it, you know, that they are saints, okay? They're not perfected in love. And we would say that the saints who are in heaven are those souls that are perfected in love. You know, <laughs> they, are, they are holy. And so uh, they know they're on the journey. So that's a good thing. You know, God put us here. He created us in his image and likeness. So there is holiness when we receive the Holy Spirit at baptism. And so um, the word saint comes from the Latin word sanctus, S-A-N-C-T-U-S, and that means holy, okay? And so we use the word holy. And uh, on our tabernacle, which is where we reserve the Blessed Sacrament in the church, it says sanctus, 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 which means holy, holy, holy. And um, that's a great descriptor. It's all over the Bible. And we're going to give a few references here in just a minute. But when we say saints, uh, we refer to that. In the spiritual realm, holiness is like perfection. It's like perfection in goodness, cleanliness, purity, without spot or wrinkle. And so God is holy. And there are degrees of holiness, okay? God is all holy. And so that's what holy, holy, holy means. You know, in the Hebrew language, uh, they didn't have superlatives and comparatives. You know, like we would say, big and then bigger and then biggest to, to talk about a gradient there of bigness, okay? Um, they, they didn't have that in their language. And so what they would do is if they wanted to show another level of big, they would say big, big. If they wanted to show the highest level of big, they would say big, big, big. So when they repeated a word three times, that was like the superlative in our English language. And so when, they, when the angels say, holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, uh, that means he's the holiest of all. And let's take a look at some of those uh, passages uh, from the Bible. If you have them, you're welcome. We'll take time to open them and highlight, or you can write down the verse, uh, the chapter and verse, and then you can highlight them later. So then you have a little go-to if you, know, you want to review this again. And so uh, we'll look at our first one here, and it's from um, Isaiah. Okay, The holy prophet Isaiah in chapter 6, verse 3 Here's what it says. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. All of the prophets were called, and there's what they call a call narrative in the Bible that describes how they were called. Jeremiah was called, Ezekiel was called, you know, uh, Moses was called. And so the, the early people, they were called by God to do something. And so when he's called by God, he kind of, all of them hesitate, you know. And uh, uh, he has this experience um, of the, of, the, of the hosts in heaven crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And so the three holies, again, and this is Old Testament, okay? And then let's look again at the, uh, let's go to the very end of the Bible. We go to Revelation, okay, uh, chapter 4. And then when John, St. John, he wrote the five books of the Bible, the three letters, the gospel, and the book of Revelation, he gets the privilege and the pleasure to see into heaven you know, the island of Patmos, and he's there. And he's given these uh, images that he wrote down in the book of Revelation. And what does he see? He records in chapter 4 uh, that the angels are there constantly surrounding God and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. And we kind of wrap that understanding into our little glory be that we say at the end of our, our class together. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as he was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Okay? Okay, so let's take a look at the next reality, and the next reality would be the church. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. We would say that the church, okay, and there's so many good definitions. The church would be 
the mystical body of Christ. The church is us, you know, one father, one family. God created us, his creatures, in his image and likeness. And so when we are united in his love, when we carry the Holy Spirit, then we would say, when we understand it, it'd be true, that the church is holy. So let's just read through. Now this is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You know, if you had your catechism there, it's just like the Bible is chapter and verse because there's different paginations and different publications. And so we, we give it both ways. If it's this edition, then we say it's page 237, but the paragraph number is 823. So we put 823 as one reference. It's like chapter and verse in this book. And so the uh, description is the church is held as a matter of faith to be unfailingly holy. Why? This is because Christ, the second person, the Son of God, of God, uh, who, I, who with the Father and the Spirit, so the Trinity, is hailed as alone holy. God alone is holy. And Jesus loved the church as his bride, giving himself up for her so as to sanctify her. He joined her to himself as his body and endowed her with the gift of the Holy Spirit, his first gift at Pentecost, for the glory of God. The church then is the holy people of God and her members are called saints. Beautiful, beautiful definition, you know. What we do in the Catholic Church, you know, we celebrate. The greatest feast day of the year is Easter, highest feast day of the year where Jesus, who did his heroic work here, his great work for all of us, he died and rose from the dead. And so when he rose from the dead, he was with them for 40 days and to let them see him and touch him and talk to him and learn more from him, okay, the 40 days. And then he ascended to the Father. So we say at 40 days, we celebrate the Feast of the Ascension. And then 10 days later, now that's 50 days in since the great uh, uh, Christ event, that's Pentecost. Pente means 50, Pentecost. And that's what he did. He sent his first gift into the world uh, as Savior and Redeemer, and that was the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what Acts of the Apostles record is that tongues as a fire descended on the apostles. And we say that God is a consuming fire, and we say that the Holy Spirit is the fire of God's love. And so here was a visible manifestation that Jesus had sent his Spirit, his Holy Spirit, into the world, and it came into their souls. And the visible sign of that coming into their souls was the fact that there was the flames, the tongues of fire on their head, okay? So that's, and, and so we would say that the church, the holy people of God is holy, unfailingly holy. Why? It was established by Jesus, founded on the rock foundation of Peter, the church, and also then it's filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, please, the next one there, Ryan, if you would. Another passage here in uh, Catechism still in this paragraph 824, United with Christ, the church is sanctified by him. His very presence here uh, sanctifies it. Through him and with him, she becomes sanctifying. Okay? So he sanctifies the church, and then the church, because of his presence there, we become sanctifying. All the activities of the church are directed where? As toward their end to the sanctification of men and women in Christ and the glorification of God. It is in the church that the fullness of the means of salvation has been deposited. It is in her that by the grace of God we acquire holiness. Do you remember back a few classes ago where we talked about are you saved, okay? And we say, yeah, past tense, we're saved. That's a once, a one-time event. Jesus died and rose from the dead and so he has atoned for the sins of mankind so we as a global people are saved, okay? And then we have to claim that for ourselves, okay? And so we are, past tense, we're saved. Present tense, we are being saved if we continue to grow in holiness. If we take the gifts that God has given us, which is the indwelling of his spirit, and then that has seven gifts, you know, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, uh, piety, and fear of the Lord. Those are gifts that we get on the day of our confirmation. Huge gifts, wisdom alone, and then courage. And so if we use those gifts, then we continue to grow in holiness, which means we're continuing to become love. God is love. And we're continuing to grow to be a loving people so that we truly reflect the creator, the redeemer in this world. And uh, so that's what the mission of the church is, is so that all men and women, the sanctification, the growing in holiness of all men and women in Christ gives great glory to God that we reflect him to the world that he created. So sure, go ahead. Well, there's two places. Um, uh, they're in Paul, one of Paul's letters there, and I think it's to... 
wh uh, the question is, where are the seven gifts in the, uh, in the Bible? And uh, Harry, I'd have to really re refresh myself, but I think it's Ephesians. I think that's where he goes over the, uh, the letter to the Ephesians, where he goes over the seven gifts and the 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit. Well, I, I believe it's in more than one place, actually, and so I just, but uh, if you'll allow me, then I'll, I'll look that up, and we'll, uh, we'll have it for you next time, okay? Thank you. you bet. Very good, okay. Next one, please. The church, we're continuing to talk about the church. We're talking about holiness, and then we're going to um, um, focus in on the fact the church, okay? Christ, the church is holy. Christ holy, innocent, and undefiled, knew nothing of sin. He was just like us in every way except sin. He never sinned. But came only to expiate the sins of the people. The church, however, clasping sin sinners to her bosom, that's you and me, the sinners, at once holy, but always in need of purification. Okay, that's us, okay? On the day of our baptism, we are holy. Because, you know, original sin is washed away, in comes God's divine life, the Holy Spirit, and like we're, we're clean. It's like, wow. If I could hold up this sheet of paper, if that's our soul, we truly reflect, white reflects, and that we truly reflect God. And then we go forward and we go out and we have bad thoughts and we have bad language and we have bad deeds and all of a sudden we get it stained up. And so we're constantly purifying this by repenting. Okay, we go back to God and we say, I'm so sorry. I offended my neighbor. I offended you and so forth. And so that's what the, we're meaning here. The church means always in need of purification because in our humanity we're weak. And so we want to grow in holiness by growing in the, the strength and the love of God. And we follow constantly on the path of penance. There you know, penance and renewal, that's our repentant, <coughs> repentance. All members of the church, including her ministers, must acknowledge that we are sinners. In everyone, the weeds of sin will still be mixed with the good wheat. Okay, remember there's, Jesus talks about the weeds and the wheat, okay? So we're in a world right now, and you know this, there are some very bad people out there, very bad people. And so... What Jesus was saying in Scripture, he's going to let them grow in the field along with the people who are in church and trying to love one another like this. And then at the end of time, he's going to take them out and separate them out. So we acknowledge that the weeds of sin are still here. And so, and the good wheat, until the end of time, hence the church gathers sinners already caught up in Christ's salvation, but still on the way to holiness. Like I tell our children in school, I say, good morning, saints. We are saints. We're saints on the journey. We're saints on the journey. We are not perfected yet, and we admit that. We admit at the beginning of every Mass. We say, let's call to mind our sins, and let's ask God for forgiveness and for strength. Every Mass. Every Mass. Every day. And so uh, we admit it. Okay. Beautiful. The next one, the church is holy. The church is therefore holy, though having sinners. So, you know, people come back and say, oh, that church you belong to, you know, I know that, 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 that I know this person there, and I know that they're in jail, and I know that they did this, and it's like, okay, all right, all right, fine. There's no denying that. There's no denying that there's sin in the church. Hear it right from me, okay? It's like, wow. You know, every human organization, because it's human, has sin. Does, is there sin in the post office? There's sin in the post office. So the post office attendant there, they offend you. They take too long or they give you a bad day or whatever. Are you never going to mail another letter again? No. That one person is not the post office. That one person is an ignorant uh, uh, employee of the post office to treat their customers rudely if that's what happened. How about Walmart? Is there sin in Walmart? Yes. It's made up of human beings. Okay? So someone treats you poorly at Walmart. Are you never going to go back to Walmart? You would never give them that power. Don't give them that power. How about a priest? If a priest offends you, if he ignores you or hurts you in some way, are you never going to go back to church because of one person? Of course not. I am not the church. I'm a member of the church. But because it's a human organization, what we're admitting here is the church is a human organization. So we're made up uh, like, you know, 1.2 billion Catholics in the world, another 1 billion Protestants, so 2.3 billion people are Christian. And they're not all perfect. And they can, that's the scandal. You know, when we, when we do something that is not good, that scandalizes the whole organization, whether it's the U.S. Army or a football team or a college or whatever. And their, their reputation, if one guy hurts it or helps it, that's, that's what we're so um, fragile that way. So, th although having sinners in her midst, because she herself has no other life but the life of grace, if they live her life, her members are sanctified. If they move away from the life of the church, they fall into sins and disorders that prevent the radiation of her sanctity. This is why she suffers 
and does penance for those offenses of which he has the power to free your children through the blood of Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, great. So the church is holy and can we grow in holiness? Absolutely. How many people do you know that don't go to church? Just that alone. If they just came back and we're, we were united as a people and we did thanks God for everything and we told them we're sorry for everything and we begged them for help for everything and we praised them for every blessing that we have, those four dimensions of prayer, then uh, boy, the whole world would be just, oh man, he'd be so pleased and we would be so um, successful because we'd be united in our love of God. Okay, please, the next one there, Ryan. Okay, so human beings are holy, not perfect here in this, in this world yet, but our soul will be perfected before it goes to heaven. So human beings are holy. We are made in God's image and likeness, and God is good, and God is holy. And so we have God's Holy Spirit dwelling in us by the grace of baptism, okay? Okay, and so we are indeed holy, but not perfectly so. Okay. Let me think if there's any more on that. Okay. The next one. Okay. This goes on to now when we have saints and we refer to them. There are some especially holy people that lead what we would say heroic lives here. Heroic from the standpoint of virtue. You know, like Mother Teresa. Who could do that? You know, Mother Teresa was a great, we call her the saint of the church. She was a Nobel Peace Prize winner and she was in uh, Calcutta, India. And she had a calling to serve the poorest of the poor which means every day, seven days a week, she was in the streets bathing those who were uh, needed to be bathed, cleaning them up, uh, feeding them, bandaging them, caring for them. And there was a uh, reporter that he was very curious about what she did and he wanted to follow her around. And he did for a day. And at the end of the day, he's kind of beat. You know, she's spending all this time doing all this ugly work. I mean, you know, people are filthy, you know, in poverty and she's cleaning them and bathing them. He says, Mother Teresa, I wouldn't do what you do for a million dollars. And she says to him, neither would I. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, see, it has to come from the heart. You, it has to be love. You couldn't be paid to do that. And so there is real love in people, like Mother Teresa. And so that would be a model of what we're to do. Not that we all have the same calling. Not that we could all do that. And everybody has a different temperament and different gifts and different personalities. But... We are indeed holy, albeit not perfectly so. And so, uh, let's see, the next one, please, there, uh, Ryan, if you would, 828. So we're still in the catechism. By canonizing, and I'm going to explain that, that's by announcing. We don't make saints. We, the church, don't make saints, but we declare them because we have studied their life and have shown them to have a, you know, a very virtuous life like Mother Teresa. By, by canonizing some of the faithful, by solemnly proclaiming, there it is, that they practiced heroic virtue and lived in faithfulness or fidelity to God's grace, the church recognizes the power of the spirit of holiness within her and sustains the hope of believers by proposing the saints to them as models and intercessors. The saints have always been the source and origin of renewal in the most difficult moments of church, the church's history. Indeed, holiness is a hidden source and infallible measure of her apostolic activity and ze missionary zeal. Okay, So canonizing is where the church you know, does great study. I mean, here, John Paul the Great, um, the day that he died and they had, uh, I'm sorry, the day of his funeral, the people were calling him saint already. And so there was a special provision made to accelerate the study of his life. You know, he was, um, I think it was 25 to 27 years as the Pope, the most widely traveled, the most loved people of all different uh, faiths and non-faiths just loved him. And so he led by all observances a very a virtuous life. But with the man that published, they want to look at all of his works to be sure there's nothing in error with regard to the teachings of the church. And look how published. I mean, you know, many things that he published, and uh, just so many things. And so uh, it took five years. So five years after he died, we call him John Paul the Great now, John Paul II. And so he is lifted up as a model. His smile, his affability, his love of children, his love of youth. Remember the World Youth Day. And he started that here and in, in Poland and so many places around the world and he just drew the young to kind of know, um, to know love. And so that's what the church is. We elevate these people. Um, God made them saints. God has perfected them in love and has them in, in his home in heaven and then we just admit that and we declare that so by, by their heroic lives. Okay, let's see what our next one is, please. 
Okay. What we're going to talk about now is the communion of saints. If perfected souls in love are in heaven, then they have a union, of course. They're all together. They're perfected in love. But it goes be beyond that. It goes beyond just those who are in heaven. And so what we're going to do is take a look at, I believe, the next slide is Catechism um, 946. Then this is the definition. After confessing the Holy Catholic Church in our creed, the Apostles' Creed, we add the communion of saints. And uh, this is like a further explanation preceding uh, what is the church if not the assembly of all the saints? The communion of saints is the church. So what we propose to help us lock this in in our minds, if I tell our children in the school that they're saints, that means that the uh, ones that are filled with the Holy Spirit and striving for good holiness here on earth, they're saints, okay? And we call that group, all of us, you and me, we call ourselves the church militant, you know? It's just a designation that we're marching toward the throne, that, you know, someday we're marching toward this growth in holiness that will merit us. We can't earn heaven. There's nothing we can do. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. But you can receive it as a gift. And if you, add, if you allow the Holy Spirit to grow, grow you in holiness, then he will take you to heaven. So we're on the journey, okay? So that's called the church militant. And then you have the church in heaven, which are the saints that are perfected. And we say that's the church glorified. Uh, sanctified or glorified. And then you have the ones that are in purgatory. And we talked about that in one of our previous classes. So if someone dies and they've grown in holiness, but they're not perfectly there yet, then God in his mercy, he allows them to be purified in this reality called purgatory so that they can burn away, have burned away anything that is preventing them from being perfect in love. And we call that the church purified. Okay? So please, if you would there, um, Ryan, let's see. The intercession of, oh, this is intercession. Can you scoot down one million? I might have them a little out of order here where we talked about. So the communion of saints is the church militant and that would be the human beings that are here on earth on the road to the kingdom of heaven, the church purified, those who have died, they're not in heaven, they're not in hell, but they're on the way to heaven and they're in purgatory and then the church glorified or sanctified and those are the souls that are in heaven. So it's a big communion. I mean, it's like, wow, it's not just that the, all the saints are in heaven. Like I say, saints in different degrees are in different realms. And please go back now, Ryan, if you would. I, I think I just I was out of order on that. We'll go back one or two slides. Okay, 956. Are you able to follow along? I think I had some handouts with this. Did you, do you have that, you guys? Are we following along? Good, good, good. Okay, I think we're at the bottom of page two. I think it says page two. And uh, 956 uh, is, uh, is the number, okay? Okay, the, inter the intercession... Pardon me? Oh, okay. I might have a different page number there, Harry, uh, as I printed out the ones that I handed out versus the ones I'm using. But please, if you would, the... Uh, um, Description in Catechism is 956, so there is a way to have intercession with the saints, the perfected souls in heaven, and this speaks to that. Okay, since they're there, they're at the throne, then being more closely united to Christ, they're in heaven. Those who dwell there fix the whole church more firmly in holiness. They do not cease to intercede with the Father for us as they proffer the merits which they acquired on earth through the one mediator between God and men, Jesus Christ, so by their fraternal concern is our weakness greatly helped. Do you know, if I was going into um, the hospital for a big operation, if I was going in like Monday, and I said, gee, you know, would you guys pray for me? Would you do that? Would you do that? Okay, thank you. So what it means that I'm asking you to beseech God the Father uh, through His Son Jesus for the grace to have uh, good care, a good doctor, a successful surgery and a good recovery. So you're praying for me as a human being. You're praying as a person who is not perfected in love. That's a very powerful thing. Your prayers are heard and very powerful. Now, if we go look at another level, so if there are souls in heaven, maybe mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, maybe there's many of the saints that are there, St. Peter, St. Paul, and you say, St. Peter, would you pray for me? You know, in our prayer we say, St. Peter, St. Paul, would you pray for me? And they do. Their prayer would be more efficacious because they are there, being more closely united to Christ. They're there at the throne. Where is Blessed Mother Mary? If you, and you know, we humans, we think in realm, terms of space and time, space. And so where, 
Where is Jesus in heaven? He's at the right hand of the Father. Okay, so I mean, this reveals that in Scripture that Jesus is there on the throne, seated at the right hand of the Father. Where is his mother? At his right hand. You can't, you can't get closer to Jesus than that. And that's why there is such a universal devotion to Blessed Mother Mary. She was the God-bearer. She was there at his life and his death. And so uh, she's there at the throne. Remember, she was assumed into heaven, body and soul. She's at the right hand of the Savior of the world. And so we say, Mary, Mother, my Mother and Mother of the Lord, please pray for me to the Lord for the grace to have a successful surgery. And so everybody, I mean, there are saints that were known for different things. There's patron saint of music. There's the patron saint of, you know, um, uh, feeding the poor. There's the patron saint of doctors. There's the patron saint of soldiers. Um, and so to, to be able to go, and so what we're saying here is that the intercession of the saints, we're asking the saints who are in heaven to intercede to the Father uh, for us with their prayers. Okay? Please, go ahead. You know, you read the Bible, Seth Brownian, so we all be ready to the last day, you know, and they have people in the bar, like the nails and stars, and different things. But where, where is that, like, the, the saints that were crucified, you know, and suffered in the first century, and different saints are dead? Are they, so, are they in heaven, or at the last, last time when Christ raises everybody out of the grave, If I think I understand what you're saying there, Harry, is at the end of the time, we say it in our creed, that there's going to be the um, resurrection. That we'd be reunited with our body. Yeah. And so, so our uh, in heaven and he raises, he raises our body. Correct. And reunites them again. Dead, right? And no matter how they died, you talked about the martyrs. They could have been burned up. They could have been blown up and they're in the bottom of the ocean. I mean, uh, wherever it is, he's going to kind of handle all that. I think it's going to be a great miracle, you know. Yeah, I mean, see, cremation, we used to be troubled with that, but cremation, well, I mean, you know, what, what we're doing, it is not um, disrespectful to the human body. Uh, we would never do that, okay? But here again, you know, we're accelerating something that's going to take place naturally. So 100 years from now, a person in the grave is going to be dust, okay? Agreed. Okay, so I say a hundred years, and I'm just that's a figure. It could be a thousand years. Okay, I, I don't know, but and there are people that don't decay, and we're going to review that here. But the church allows it because you, we're, we're in, in one standpoint, all you're doing is accelerating what's going to take over anyway. So if you put grandma and grandpa in the um, in the casket, and then a thousand years from now, it's going to be nothing. Okay, so what we're doing is you're accelerating the going to ashes. Okay, and then you can put that in a niche and still revere it. So we don't talk about sprinkling the ashes, the cremains. That is holy. So we ask for the people to keep them contiguous. You don't sprinkle them at sea or on the mountain or put them in your watch or any of that stuff. It's like, no, no. That would kind of profane the resurrection because if they're together and then the soul, and then, then they come back together, okay? I mean, God can do anything, but I think just the statement you're making, you know, do, do you really understand that you're separating the cremains of this? We, are, we consider them holy. That's the holy cremains or remains of a human being. And we incense it, and we bless it, and so forth. To have that scattered, it just is something that we're not okay with. Pray for... Well, see, that's just their physical, Harry. Is the question is, is it okay to pray for them? You're praying for their soul. You're praying for their immortal soul, which at the moment of death is going to be judged in the particular judgment as we talked about. And is the soul with God. I don't care what happens to my body. Okay, here, you know, whatever they do. And so many people suffered so horribly in war and in martyrdom and all that. And it doesn't matter. They were ready to be thrown to the lions. They said, bring it on, you know. I'm going to the Father, you know. And so... Yeah, so how he manages all that at the end of time and brings it together, God, who can do anything, is going to make that all, all fine. Right. And okay. Or hell, yeah. Or hell. Yeah, okay. yeah. One of those three. And then at the end of time, there'll be no purgatory. There's going to be with God or apart from God, you'll have heaven or hell. And so um, the idea is to be in purgatory or heaven so that you can make the cut. Well, I mean, uh, it reveals in Matthew 25, you know, that he's going to come at the end of the time 
uh, with the end, end of time with the angels, and he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. And so those that are already in eternity, they'll be there as saints, and then the other ones will either rise from the ground or still be living. And so, yeah, that's going to be, uh, that, w that will all be um, a judgment day. Okay, so that's 956. Please, if we go to the next one there, all right, let's see where we are. Okay, so I think you have one that has scripture references that says saints at the top. Okay, we'll just take a peek at a few. Okay. Different Bible translations, when the word saint, which we use for the holy ones, uh, that would be used is spelled out. That would say, and the holy ones. Paul would say, and the holy ones. Okay. So here we are, Old Testament, the book of wisdom, the souls of the just, okay, the just, are in the hand of God. This is commonly read at funerals, where the people pick an Old Testament um, passage about what happened to their loved one. So the souls of their loved one, of the just, if they led a good life in union with God, are in the hand of God and no torment will touch them. So that's beautiful. I mean, what a beautiful vision to have for closure when you lose a dear one, okay? That they're not going to be, if they were in pain and suffering, you know, before they died, and that they would not go to uh, eternal punishment in hell. Okay, Hebrews. Uh, the letter to the Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, okay, okay. See, we don't have the eyes of eternity, and so um, it's difficult to understand. But you know, could it be possible that there are um, a nearness that we can't appreciate just yet to the souls and the angels that are in eternity? Okay, and so what the letter to the Hebrews is saying: since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings and persevere in running the race that lies before us while keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and perfecter of faith. Um, there's a passage in Mark, there's several passages where Jesus allowed the apostles, J Peter, James, and John most often, to see into eternity. So remember his transfiguration? He goes up there and Peter, James, and John are with Jesus and they could see there's Jesus and there's Elijah. And there's Moses, and they're talking. You remember the passage, okay? So here it is. It's Mark 4 is one um, of the synoptic gospels that reviews that. Jesus is seen conversing with men who lived. Um, Moses was like uh, 1,200 years before Jesus, and Elijah um, before that. So it's like, oh, okay. Um, if we had the eyes of eternity like Jesus, then we would be able to see the, the saints and the angels that are there in eternity. And... I believe that in reality the saints and the angels are there in a big way at every Mass because wherever Jesus is there are those who are adoring Him and worshiping Him. And I'd like to show you just a little snippet I found on the YouTube. We'll lower the lights here in just a minute and we're going to show a little YouTube here and then you can choose to watch it again if you want. I found it very powerful with regard to how this producer made it so real about what might be happening at Mass and it plants the seed. So. Uh, are, are we ready on that one there, right? Let me go ahead. I'm going to adjust the sound if need be, and I'll lower the um, the lights over here. Okay. And um, I think we lower these two. Okay. And thank you.
so that when it does occur, you may believe the word of the Lord. with the angels and all the saints declare your glory as with one voice we claim bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you
Yeah, that, so now you can. It's called the veil removed, and you can sure do that. And thanks for making it work there, Ryan. That's so powerful when you can tie it into what we're talking about. And so I think they did a nice job. I mean, you know, to think that that's the perspective. You know, wherever Jesus is, there's all the angels and saints in adoration and glory. It's like, wow, if we could really see that, it'd be so huge. So that's a beautiful uh, representation of that. Okay, let me see where we left off here. Got it. Okay, great. So, you know, we have this Bible called the Catholic Answers Bible, and I'll show you a copy here in just a few. They have several questions in here that relate to our topic tonight, which is the saints. And so on your handout, do you still have that, uh, folks, where it says the saints on the top, and it talks about uh, scripture references? E1 would be, do the Catholics communicate with the dead? Okay, I think we, yeah, do Catholics pray to the dead? Okay. That's one of the questions, and they give a nice answer in here. Um, it's um, E1 in the Catholic Answers Bible. It's page 350, 350, in one version. I don't know. There's a couple of editions of that. But basically, we've got a lot to cover, folks. But here again, basically what it is, is Catholics do not pray to have a conversation with the saints. You know, we're not channeling the saints. We're not trying to talk to mom. You know, we're not trying to do that at all. So uh, asking for the saints' intercession, asking for you know, Blessed Mother Mary to pray for me or for my mom or whatever. Asking for their intercession is not an attempt to conjure up the dead, okay? It is simply acknowledges that those who are in heaven, perfected in Christ and his love, are able and willing to help us by God's grace, okay? That's all different than uh, these people that are trying to channel and trying to communicate and um, have dialogue with the dead. We don't do that, okay? And so... Um, there is a book I'll call The New Age Nightmare. You know, The New Age was started in California by a man um, that thought that was great and for years um, touted that as a way to, to live. And so there's quartz crystals and there's a way to conjure up the dead and communicate with them dead. And he finally had the experience of actually seeing the devil where the veil was removed to him for what he was doing. When the veil was removed, the devil who is... Um, and it's a fallen archangel, you know, a very powerful spirit. And when that veil was removed, he was so horrified at what he saw. He was so horrified about the ugliness and the, the hurt of the devil that he stopped. And he, he's the guy that started the New Age. And so he wrote this book called The New Age Nightmare. And if you read it, you'll be scared just reading it. But I think it's, uh, it just goes to show um, that there is no doing that. Um, there are bad spirits, and the devil is bad, and we don't want to be involved in any of that. So we don't try to channel, communicate, or anything uh, with the dead. We don't you know, do that. What, Harry, there's nothing wrong with asking for their help, okay? But it's not like, Mom, speak to me, okay? Absolutely we can. That's what we're saying here. We're, it's not an attempt to conjure them up. It simply acknowledges that they're in heaven perfected and that they're willing and able to help us. So, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, please, Mom, pray for me. She prayed for me here, so she's probably praying for me there. And um, so that's all good. Ask them to help us. So the next one would be in H4. Uh, at the H4, why do Catholics pray to saints and angels? Like I say, we're calling on uh, the saints that have gone, the men and women that have gone before us that are perfected in love, and so they're just nearer to the throne. And boy, when you're hurting, when it's your health, or when you need uh, some real good help, why not avalanche heaven uh, to, to help you with that? So we do, we do. And in every Mass we say, and like the Father said in the movie, and all the angels and saints, you know, the, the communion of angels and saints. Um, uh, let's pray together, okay. You know, and uh, you may know that there's a couple of saints, St. Anthony, St. Andrew, you know, St. Peter, St. Paul, but uh, there's so many saints. I, want, I brought a box of books here. I just want to show you some. It is customary in the Catholic Church to name your child after a saint. It's like, wow, you know? And so... They weren't made up names for a real long time, and it seems a little bit in vogue now where you make up a name, but you know, to think that there was a person in history that 
um, did real good and was called in heaven as a saint. So they have books out. This is a dictionary, patron saint names, okay? And they have books like this that you can... Okay, okay, good. And uh, like I say, there's so many. Okay, this um, 6,000 male and 8,000 female names, okay? Over 2,000 patron saints, okay? So, I mean, this is an idea. And then when people come into church or youngsters in eighth grade, they become confirmed, they pick a saint name, uh, their middle name, okay? It's not legal. You don't have to ever sign it or anything. In our family, uh, our history in our family was that mom and dad gave us a first name and then we picked our second name when we got confirmed. So my first name is Michael, my given name. And then at uh, confirmation, I picked Joseph. Okay, that's my dad's name and uh, St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus. And so then I'm Michael Joseph, okay? And, but there's so many ways. And so if you look for baby names or if you're looking for confirmation names, the number of saint names are here in the thousands. And this is just one book, just one iteration of that. Okay, and I want to show you a few more, okay? Uh, John Paul the Great, John Paul II's Book of Saints. Because when he was here as the Pope, like I say, for I think 27 years, it says that here on the back cover, it says that he um, performed more than 700 beatifications, and we're going to talk about what that is, and then 300 canonizations. That's where they're declared saint, okay? There's a level before that called beatification and then canonization. That's a lot. So that's a 1,000 men and women that he... Um, affirmed that are in heaven after their study, and uh, he declared them saints. John Paul the Great, okay? Um, they have books such as this, um, and it's loaded with saints in it. It gives like two pages of their life, and so there's all kinds of saints. St. Saint Thomas, St. Patrick, St. Joseph, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Rita of Cascia, St. Maria Goretti, St. Therese of France, St. Jude. There's just so many. St. Lucy. And so a book like this would kind of give a little um, one or two pages of review bio of their life, and when you're looking for names, say, gosh, I never knew that St. Barbara is the patron saint of sudden death, protection against lightning, and artillerymen and architects. And you may want to choose that for your child or something. So that's a great book, okay? And then, um, let's see, I want to show you a few more of the multiple saints. This is the first book I got as a little kid, okay? It says, Our Friends the Saints. And it's a good book. It's still available. It's still available, okay? And so in it, it goes through the really renowned ones, okay? St. Francis of Assisi, you know? and St. Edward, and St. Dominic, and uh, they're so good. So as a little kid, you're learning about that there are perfected souls in heaven that we call saints, and gosh, they live good lives. There's just a little paragraph on each one, and you kind of come to know them. What, what did St. Joseph do, you know? What did St. Christopher, you know, everybody, many people have the St. Christopher level medal that they wear, St. Charles, and so forth. But these little books are good for children uh, to kind of get an overview of those that are in heaven, and... Uh, then there are uh, books that are written, you know, from a historical standpoint about the saints. I love this one. It's called The Bones of St. Peter. The Bones of St. Peter. It was really, really rich indeed what it is. You know, we have in Rome, we have St. Peter's uh, Basilica, St. Peter, uh, the cathedral, okay? And so you have this church that has had two or three different renditions to it because of the foundation, okay? That they had to rebuild it after it was hurt, destroyed. But when they went excavating, they went under it, and right under the main altar, it's the largest church in the world, and right under the main altar, where the altar ended up when they dug down and dug down under these different three, two or three levels of excavations, they found this faceplate, which was loaded with um, designations there that were very hard to interpret. And when they finally interpreted them, you know, they found, it says, here lie the bones of Peter, okay? And the reason it was in a code was because, you know, in the early church, there was great persecution. If you were a Christian, you were dead, you know, that for 300 years, Christians were really under persecution. And that's why they went in the catacombs and they celebrated mass underground and they had all these graveyards. And there's a graveyard under the St. Peter's. And when it talks about how they found that grave and how it is revered today, now when you go into St. Peter's, when you go in there, they have a walkway that goes down there and it's got candles all around it and they have the glass. It's like as big as our board. And you can look at it. And on the other side of that is the tomb of St. Peter. The tomb of St. Peter, 2,000 years ago. And uh, it's got little pictures in here and everything. It shows the passageways, how they excavated and went down there. But it's just a real thing. So here's the life of a saint. Um, where, and not the life, but the, the, the account of locating the bones of St. Peter uh, that was the first pope of the church, okay? Sorry? If you'd like, sure.
The remark here is that there's mass in English in Rome, but Harry, that's all, there's mass in St. Peter's. You know, they have... In Rome, there's a church where they have English in mass. Okay, yeah. They have, I think it's like 27 or 30 altars in St. Peter's. It's that big. And they have masses going on through the day in all the different languages. So there's Spanish. Okay, all right, all right. There's uh, books that come out with uh, writers that try to inspire us. Um, here's Rediscover the Saints. And so for a person who doesn't know about them in their life, it's a quick read, Matthew Kelly, and it's a beautiful book, Rediscover the Saints. But uh, you can learn a lot just by these little guys. And then there's um, ones that have written, remember I talked about Mother Teresa. Here's her recollections of how to get to heaven. It's just beautiful, you know, with regard, she's got the simple path. And let me think if I can find it in the beginning here. The simple path. This is for Mother Teresa. The fruit of silence is prayer. We would teach you later. We're going to teach you. You've got to come to quiet. The fruit of silence is prayer. The, pr the fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. And the fruit of service is peace. Get, get to the Prince of Peace. So I'll let you see it afterward, Harry. And so, uh, but this is a great book. It's a simple path. But there, my whole wall is filled with books at home. And I could only bring like 20 here. But this is a sample of the saints, okay? We talked about Blessed Mother Mary, and there's a book called The Essential Mary Handbook. And it's just loaded with uh, the early church fathers, what they had to say about Mary, favorite prayers about Mary, novenas about Mary, the Christmas season. And so you can learn a lot. There's, it's a summary of beliefs, devotions, and prayers of uh, the mother of the Savior of the world, Blessed Mother Mary. So she's the holiest of the saints. We call her Queen of Saints, and she's in heaven, okay? Then we have some saints that have written their um, allocutions, what they, are, what they had heard from God. And here's the diary of um, St. Uh, Faustina, okay, a great saint, modern-day saint. And so it's a great work. It's like 600 pages, yeah, 680. And so it's a book where you can read this and hear you know, her thoughts and her inspirations in her life. And so, uh, again, on a holy woman in order to be a model for you, okay? Let's see. And then a uh, great saint, early church, uh, St. Augustine, okay? St. Augustine, fourth century. And this is the city of God. And so beautiful work, uh, very, very, very high level in uh, the city of God. Uh, the autobiography of St. Therese of France. The autobiography, the story of a soul. So the saint wrote her own book. And uh, Mary and the Fathers of the Church. To put together, when we say the Fathers of the Church, that's the first 300 or so years of the Church where you had all of the ones that were really close to him, really close to the Christ event, you know, who was the Pope in the first 100 years and all that. And so they're their um, revelations and their insights were really, really clear and really great. So um, another book like this would help you to understand Mary as the mother of God. Mary and the Fathers of the Church is a great work. And um, let's see. So there's just so many. Uh, we have books all over with regard to the saints. We have feast days. You now you all have a birthday, like we have a birthday today for Phoebe, okay? And so the, typically when a, per, when a saint is declared a saint, there's a, a, year, a day of the year that is uh, picked to celebrate them on that day every year. And so we have a feast day. And as we go through the year, for those that go to church daily, we wear different color vestments to res designate that we're celebrating the feast day of a saint. White is for a saint. Um, a red is for a martyr and things like that. Also. So that's good. We have feast days. We have patron saints. Um, we have the canonization. I want to refer to that. Is, do we have a slide? Oh, there's um, canonization. Good. But well, those are uh, just a picture, a collage of many saints. But the re to be a saint, okay, there's two levels before you get there. The first one is two. Well, this is uh, canonization. So the first level, there's three levels, is venerable. And so if there is a person who led a heroically virtuous life and the church is examining their life, we are, say that they are venerable, okay? Like we have the men's club, the Knights of Columbus, and so Michael McGivney uh, has been venerable, okay, for a while, which means that he's worthy of uh, considering as a holy person a good model in life, okay? And then if they explore, they can be declared uh, to the next level, which is blessed, and there are many men and women that are in that stage here where we call them Blessed Pio or Blessed, you know, Michael or whatever as far as a saint. And then the third level would be saint. That's where we call that canonization. One is beatification and one is called canonization. And that's where uh, the church then declares them 
as a saint, as, a, as, as truly a perfected soul who is in, in heaven. Okay, very good. And then what are holy relics? And you may know if you start exploring the early church that there was such an attachment and attraction to these holy people that uh, certain churches and certain people wanted to have remnants of them. For They wanted to have some of their fingernail, they wanted to have a lock of their hair, and even got more brutal than that. They wanted maybe part of their finger or a bone or something like that. And so there's this attachment to holy relics. And there's three levels of those too. One is a part of the person, and then one would be a part of um, an actual body part of the saint. They call it a first class relic, okay? So if you had a lock of hair of uh, Saint Faustina, that would be a very holy item that you would revere. You know, if that was a holy person and that's part of them, that's like, yeah, and we're going to look where it is in Scripture that that uh, is efficacious. And the second level would be something that they touched, like when you go to a CC. I've been to a CC uh, over there in um, in Italy, and so they have the brown robe that was worn by Saint Francis. Okay, they have the books that he read from. They had different things, you know, the cincture and the, the different things that he touched. So to have one of those or to have part of it, that would be another level of holiness is something that the saint actually touched. I have my dad's black jacket. My, I love my dad wearing his black jacket. When my dad passed to eternity, you know, we started divvying up things. And every time I put that on, I just think that's, you know, that was dad's, you know, it was so great and so super. And so it's just a great thing. And so to have a, 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 a memorial of that or a memento is just a beautiful thing. Okay, and then we revere, normally these are put in churches. You know, like St. Bernard up there in Coleman, they have many relics, and so that's a worthy and a holy spot to revere these relics. And then another relic would be something touched it. So a lot of times in the mail, you may get a little kerchief or something, and they say, we took this kerchief and we touched it to a second-class relic. So we touched it to the garment of St. Francis of Assisi, and so now it's with you. And to a level there, you say, wow, that would be a holy item too. You know, we would consider it holy because it touched something that the uh, saint had touched. And so if you hear about relics, this is where it comes from uh, in the desire of the church to stay close to holiness. And so we revere the relics, okay? And uh, let's see where that might be in scripture, okay? Why do believers desire to have relics? We're going to give you three examples briefly from Scripture here. And the first one would come from Old Testament, okay, in Second Kings, okay. Contacts with Elisha. Remember, there was Elijah and Elisha, okay, the two prophets. And so by having contact with his bones, that restored life. Wow. I mean, there must be some power there if indeed life was restored through contact with a saint's bones. And that was Old Testament, okay. Why do we want to have relics? And the next one would be uh, New Testament. Acts of the Apostles, okay, it, it reveals that when Peter would go to those who were hurting, just having his shadow um, come close to them, uh, they were experienced a cure. Wow, wow. The holy guy, I mean, holy Saint Peter. So a cure was performed in scripture uh, by the casting of Peter's shadow. And then uh, the face cloths of Saint Paul. So Acts 19 talks about cures being um, provided there um, no problem, through the face claws that touched uh, St. Paul. Beautiful. So there is something in Scripture that lends to the fact that there is some uh, efficaciousness to uh, the relics and the um, close association with the saints. Okay, beautiful. There's never been reference to the remains of St. Paul. They beheaded them and where, where that ended up, I don't know. Okay, let's see just a few more things, folks, and then we'll um, come to a close here. Please, what is the next part there, uh, Brian, do we have? Okay, okay, and so then they have that supernatural phenomenon. Folks, do you have that page, too? Was that one we copied? It says supernatural phenomenon at the top. I don't either. Do, do you have that supernatural phenomenon? Beautiful. Thank you. Just, I know we tried to copy and just make it easy for the notes. These are different. You know, there's natural and there's supernatural. Okay, so by location. How is it that these great saints, some of them, were able to be seen in two places at the same time? Like Padre Pio, a modern day saint, 1968, he died. It's like, oh, here he was in, in this city in Rome, or in Rome, and then he's in this city over here. It's like at the same time. So that's a gift. You would say that that's something that's called bilocation, by meaning two, where the saint appeared to be in two different places. Levitation, some saints were so in deep meditation that as they prayed, they kind of 
rose up. They would kind of rise off of the ground. They were in ecstasy in their prayer, and we call that levitation. And so there's accounts of that, levitation, ecstasy. Experience the enrapture of body and soul in momentary bliss. I've seen it myself where there was these pe people from um, um, Europe that had these uh, Medjugorje, where they had had uh, locutions from Blessed Mother Mary. And so I got to pray the rosary with one of them, and as we prayed the rosary around the bed and everything, she went into this deep ecstasy, like she was in total uh, joy. And uh, as we prayed through the rosary, and then she came out of it, and it's sort of like, that would be a gift, a supernatural phenomena that is associated with uh, the graces of God. And what she was doing, she was praying um, to the Blessed Mother Mary, the Mother of the Lord. Okay, prolonged abstinence. There are saints uh, that have been able to survive on just the Holy Eucharist for years, for years. They're in bed, and for some reason uh, they're sick in whatever way, but they don't eat. And you know if you don't eat uh, that you can't live very long. But here, like St. Catherine of Siena, what a mystic, what a great. And she was deep into meditation, and she went eight years without eating food, just the Eucharist every day, the body and blood of Jesus. The stigmata, you know, our Lord suffered the wounds on his hands and his feet and his side. And so when that shows up in a human being, we call it the stigmata. And the first time that that happened was St. Francis of Assisi, 1200s. And so uh, he carried the wounds of Christ in his hands and his feet and his side. And uh, uh, it's, it's on your sheet there. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi, about the fifth one down. And then St. Catherine and then Padre Pio, uh, like one of my favorite saints. He's a modern day saint, died in 68. And Padre Pio for 50 years, 50 years, <laughs> He had his hands wrapped, so when he prayed Mass, they just kept bleeding. They just kept bleeding. So you can see the pictures of him have his hands wrapped and his feet. It was very painful. I mean, you might think that that's pretty cool. I got the wounds of Christ, but it's very painful. And then the wound in his side. Never got infected, okay? So we would look at it as a supernatural event, a supernatural indication that this person has been chosen um, to be a very holy person. And he had, he's called him Saint Padre Pio. Okay, the ability to read souls, he was a great confessor. And for many of those years, people would come to him for God's correction, for God's blessing. And they would come and uh, they would say, I did this and this and this. And he would have this ability to read their soul. And he would say, and what about that? How about that woman you were with there, you know, a year ago? And you weren't supposed to be with her. And, ah, you know? and so it's a gift. It's a supernatural gift that God has given to certain people, the ability to read souls. The odor of sanctity. With the purity of heart and so forth, some people are blessed to be emitting this odor of like roses and they're not wearing perfume. And I experienced that once too with this woman who came to do a retreat. She doesn't wear perfume, but she had been doing it for years. She was actually in a concentration camp in Germany during the war and finally was freed from all of that. And she went around just pre uh, teaching the love of Jesus Christ. And when you got close to her and I had a conversation with her, you could smell this beautiful bouquet of roses and it was coming from her. And that's called the odor of sanctity. That would be kind of our goal, is to die in the odor of sanctity, which means we're, we're so imbued with the uh, purity and the holiness that God wants us to radiate, that it just kind of, you can get it by scent, okay? Incorruptibility, the last one there that's supernatural. And that's called the, abil the ability that you're dead, but you're not decaying, you're not deteriorating. And there are many. This book is one called, I showed you the books of some saints, it's called The Incorruptibles. And for whatever reason, God is demonstrating that they lie in the grave for years, and it's like they didn't die. They're like they're asleep. And so through time, you can see there's some pictures in here where they have shown uh, men and women that are considered incorruptible. And uh, the church, when a person is very holy, what they do is sometimes they relocate their tomb, like St. Elizabeth Ann Seton up there in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. She died here, but then they built a shrine for her. So they took her out of here and they moved her over to the shrine. And when they do that, sometimes they open the casket. And when they open it, they find out, oh my gosh, uh, it's like she never, never passed away. And so another supernatural phenomenon that uh, is another way that God is saying that that person that lived in your world of space and time, she was heroically holy, heroically virtuous, and uh, she's got the gift of incorruptibility. On the bottom of the page there, you see those are some, just a listing of some of the saints. And uh, we believe John Paul the Great, he died in 2005, and the last time they opened the casket, here it is 15 years later, he looks like he's not beginning to corrupt. Okay, so, and Padre Pio, 68, another very holy man that had the stigmata. So, 
just when you hear about the saints, it's like, wow, um, God is showing us the models of holiness and kind of giving them special blessings. And then folks, uh, on the last page there, I think that we gave you, it's called the saints at the top with scripture passages there. And at your leisure, if you would take a peek at some of those with regard to how often, how often uh, scripture speaks about the saints. Paul is always talking about the holy ones. And so in Ephesians, a couple of places, uh, Thessalonians, Philemon, and of course, Revelation with John, uh, with, the, with the saints, okay? Okay, who are the saints? The saints are men and women whose heroic lives witness to the gospel. So the church holds them up. We don't make them saints. And they in their heroic lives achieve the level of love and perfection that will enable them to go to heaven and give glory to God. And so the church holds them up as examples and inspirations of what the grace of God is able to do when one turns to the Lord and offers him his life, him, offers to the Lord, uh, follow his way, okay? So it's a holy thing, good deal. Okay, and please, what's, here's uh, the canonization of seven. This is just an example, folks. This is not so many years ago where there was a canonization, and that's St. Peter's, okay? And that's where many of them are done. And so that day, there's pictures on the front. There's another picture here. But that's where the Pope would be down there, and that's where in the context of Mass, he declares that they are now ever to be considered a saint of the church, and they give him a feast day. They give him a date. Here they are, okay? That man on the left was a martyr. He was in uh, South America not so long ago, within the 1900s. And so one day, there was great antagonism toward the Catholic Christians there. And one day he was celebrating Mass in church. It's just as he left, held up the Eucharist, they shot him. And he died at the altar. And he had brought so many people to the Lord. He really did such good work there. And there was just such hatred on the military government that didn't want him to do that. And so they drew straws. It shows in the movie. There's one called Romero. That's the name of the movie. That's how I got educated on it. But they killed him. So he died a martyr. This is Pope uh, Paul VI. What a great pope. And um, he brought to uh, conclusion the uh, Vatican II and um, the Great Council in the 60s. And then the other ones I'm not as familiar with, but you can just see there's so many. Just those were the ones uh, that were canonized that day. Doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, there can be one or more uh, saints that uh, Rome declares to be saints. Okay. Okay, I think that I think that we're coming to the end there, and I want to thank you. We went just a little over. We're gonna next week. We're going to begin the mass. We just would love it if you would come and spend four times. This is how we worship. It's the greatest thing we do. We pray the holy mass. We're gonna have two classes that are about what we actually do, and then two classes about where's that in the Bible, and you know, start to make sense. It makes so everything we do has meaning. Every image in the church has meaning, and so it's like if you were to go to a hockey game and you'd never been to a hockey game before, you have no idea what they're doing. What is icing? What's the blue line? What's the penalty box? What is all that? But after it's explained to you, then it's like, oh, oh, well, now I know. And now I can really get involved in the game. And so to come to Mass, there's great grace, even if you don't understand. But after you start to understand some of the meanings of the mystery, it's a great mystery. It's not magic. It's a mystery. And you start to understand that it's like, wow, like you saw in that movie. It's like, wow, could this really be happening that we're in the midst of the saints and angels? It's like beautiful. So let's whisper a little prayer again. Thank you for being here. Who is it there is a saint of music here or that? Uh, there are many, Harry, and, and even, even by instrument, yeah. So there are many, the music, music uh, in voice and in uh, instrument. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. And the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be safe going home. Happy birthday, Phoebe. And uh, all of you, please come back again. We'd love to have you. Thank you.